Gila, and hello to everyone. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Sybil Nelson. I work um, as a consultant at FAO, and I'm speaking today on behalf of my colleague, Sophia Huyer, who is the Gender and Social Inclusion Research Leader with the CCAFS program. Today, I will be speaking about gender in the context of climate smart agriculture. But before I get into detail, I would just like to make sure that everyone has the same basic familiarity with the term gender and what we mean when we talk about it. So I'll begin with a cartoon to put a smile on all of our faces. As you can see, we have on the left women who are carrying water and on the right we have men who are in a meeting. And it looks like there are some local men speaking with a man visiting perhaps from the government. And one of the men is saying, women? They are too busy to discuss water. And that's the joke because, of course, there are the women busy carrying water. And the idea of this cartoon is to show men and women's different roles and how sometimes maybe we overlook the different roles that men and women have. And gender is a term that helps us to talk about these roles. Gender refers to um, the qualities and characteristics that society applies to men and women. These are the roles and behaviors that we learn from our context that we grow up in. And of course, the roles and behaviors of men and women can change over time and from location to location. But everywhere we go, we see that gender shapes the power and dynamics of men and women. Um, for example, research has found that ethnic gender and seniority hierarchies shape the processing of climate information among different groups in Uganda. So gender is a social term, but it helps us to understand how men and women interact with each other and the world. And we talk about gender in the context of climate smart agriculture for a few reasons. First, we know that there is a gender gap in agriculture. The gender gap in agriculture is a pattern documented worldwide in which women have less access to productive resources, financial capital, and advisory services in comparison to men. For example, 43% of the work, agricultural workforce is made up of women, and yet only 5% of extension resources reach women. So here we see a gap between men and women in terms of their access to information. And in the context of climate smart agriculture, this means that men and women are often not starting on an even playing field. It's as if men have a head start. This is not to say that men, farmers, foresters, and fishers don't face challenges. Of course they do. But it means rather that by looking at gender, we can better understand the difference in people and we often see that the differences are that women are in a more disadvantaged position. And this gap between men and women can have serious implications for the adoption and sustainability of practices under a CSA approach. For example, research carried out by CCAFs in Kenya found that women were much less likely than men to be aware of CSA practices. But when a concerted effort was made to improve awareness among men and women, women were just as likely or even more likely than men to adopt the CSA practices. So we see that while there may be differences, they can also be overcome. And in general, a gender sensitive approach in the agricultural context improves agricultural productivity, food security and nutrition, and it also enhances well being. What do we mean by a gender responsive approach? I would like to define this term before giving you some more concrete examples. A gender responsive approach means that the particular needs, priorities, and realities of men and women need to be recognized and adequately addressed in the design and application of climate smart agriculture. This means that by taking this approach, both men and women can equally benefit. We also would like to see gender sensitive indicators in our monitoring of CSA to ensure that we're tracking the benefits received by men and women. Now in the brief that's part of the series produced by the Global Alliance, we um, have a series of five criteria to help you understand whether or not a CSA practice can be considered gender responsive. 
um, and I'll just walk you, explain you quickly what each of these five criteria are. The first is to use gender analysis. Gender analysis is a socioeconomic approach where we explore who has what and why, who does what and why, who makes decisions and why, and who needs what and why. We ask these questions about who, what, and why to better understand the site-specific gender, cultural, and socioeconomic context. We want to do this also to explore differential vulnerability of men and women to risk, and also how they access information. When we have established a better understanding with, through gender analysis, we're then able to promote our second criteria, participation and engagement of men and women. We want to ensure that female and male farmers, fishers, and foresters are involved in the development, adaptation, testing, and adjustment of practices to meet their needs, priorities, and, um, and preferences. We also can use the findings of gender analysis to reduce the constraints to uptake of the practice. We want to ensure that we understand where there might be barriers, for example, unequal access to information or ownership of land. And we want to try to address these or be aware of them in order to ensure that uptake of practices can proceed. Our last two criteria refer to benefits. We want to see both immediate benefits for men and women, but also long-term benefits. Immediate, immediate benefits include increases in agricultural yield, reduction in the time spent on agricultural labor, and also an increase in women's access to and control of inputs and income. We'd also like to see longer term changes. So an increase in real resilience of men and women, an increase in their control of resources, and also increased participation in decision-making of women and also youth. The brief that I've referred to goes into more detail to explain better how to look at these criteria and also how to explore practice by practice what some of the gender dimensions are. Here I present a chart where we're looking at, for example, conservation agriculture. And in our brief, we talk about where um, there's an impact on women's control of income from the practice. We also look at requirements for adoption of practice. This helps you think through the different gender dimensions of a specific practice. So for conservation agriculture, we propose that there is a low impact on women's control of income. But at the same time, um, there's a low requirement for females to be able to access cash and their ability to spend it for adoption of this practice. So you can see that this would not be a barrier and we could perhaps proceed with this practice in a context in which women have low access to cash. This is explained in further detail in the brief, as are additional research findings, indicators, as well as case studies. And I'd like to just remind you that a gender responsive approach is based on asking who. So while it can be quite complicated with these different dimensions with regards to access to different services and control, um, as long as you're asking yourself who and, and, and um, identifying who is benefiting, who is participating, you're, um, you're taking a gender sensitive approach. So in conclusion, just to present the key messages here today to keep in your mind, the gender gap in agriculture affects how men and women access and benefit from climate smart agriculture. And so by adopting a gender responsive approach to CSA, we address this gap and we recognize the specific needs and capabilities of women and men and site-specific CSA practices that are also gender responsive can lead to improvements in the lives of smallholders, that means farmers, fishers, and foresters, as well as more sustainable results. And so if you'd like to learn more, I'd like to point you towards not only our brief, but also the FAO and CCAF's websites where you can find online re learning resources and additional research results. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.